Good morning. God is good? All the time. Amen. Amen. So thank you for joining us, everybody, here this morning in the sanctuary and online this fifth Sunday after Epiphany. Just a reminder, we offer two worship services every Sunday, 8.30 a.m. traditional and 10.30 a.m. contemporary. Both are streamed on YouTube and Facebook as well as in person. Also a reminder that we offer a lot of Bible studies here at the church. We encourage everyone to take advantage of these opportunities to deepen your faith. And we actually have too many to list, so I'm going to defer to the bulletin news and notes. There's a full calendar, a full listing of all of what is available and happening here at the church. We also have an email that goes out weekly called HNLC Connect that has also detailed listings of what's happening here at the church. So if you do not get that email, please see me after service. Give me your email address and we'll add you to the database. Also a reminder that we do have our Wednesday online prayer gatherings at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And if you are not participating in that and would like to, please see me after service once again with your email address and we'll add you to that database. We also have our Ladies Retreat coming up in Ocean City on March 1st to 3rd. Registration is still happening. It's $90, so you still want to go. If you want more details, you can please see Becky, Lagita, Terry, or Claire. We have a number of volunteer positions that are open here at the church. I'm going to defer once again to the HNLC Connect email that goes out, as, also, as well as the bulletin board in the Narsex, right above the visitor registration. If you're interested in any of those positions, you can fill out the little form or see Pastor Okai, Karen Zambikos, or myself for more details. On February 13th, we have our annual Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper from 5 to 7 p.m. Tickets are on sale. If you would like to come and join us for that, please see Debbie after service and we'll get you hooked up. Ticket sales are a little low on that, so in order for us to pull it off, we have to Sell some more tickets, so come on, peeps. Let's come on out and enjoy ourselves on that. With raffle, silent auction, music, good food, good fellowship. We also have our children's Easter celebration happening on March 23rd. That is now called Pancakes and Praise, an Easter family breakfast. Saturday, March 23rd from 10 to 12. Free admission on that one. We're going to have not only the breakfast, but we're going to have crabs for the kids, an Easter message, an Easter egg hunt for children 10 and under, and a visit from the Easter Bunny. So bring your family, friends, neighbors, people on the street, anybody want to drag in? It'd be wonderful to have everybody here. And also, one other announcement this morning, since uh, Ken Maurer couldn't be here in the service, we're going to do his announcement. We have uh, our member of the month for the month of February, happens to be Don Hastings. So congratulations, Don. I know you're not here in this service, you usually attend the first service, but you'll probably pick up on the live stream. You know, Don usually works a night shift, so he's not much around in the evening times, but he shows up to church and he ushers and greets. You know, so we congratulate Don Hastings and you can use the member of the month parking spot. Our January mission of the month, was the emergency fund, and we received $547 for that fund. So we thank you for the donations. And the February mission of the month is the HNLC Family Life Ministry. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn things over now to our senior pastor, Pastor Andrew O'Connor. Assisting him in worship this morning is Elder Will McFarland. And we also have the praise team with us this morning under the direction of Dan Lorman. So we thank you for joining us. If you're a visitor here with us this morning, we hope you've been warmly welcomed into our fellowship. And we will turn things over now to Mr. Will. Praise God. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I heard a couple of announcements in there that sounded interesting to me. Gary, you had the announcement that we're doing the pancake supper. Shrove Tuesday, which would be the 13th, right? Yep. The 13th. So if you're cheap and you want to have a Valentine's date on the 13th, there you go. There you go. We got it done for you. 
So, and the other thing was women's retreat coming up. There are still registration opportunities. And uh, my registration was rejected. So I will not be going to the women's retreat this year, but uh, maybe I'll try again next year. See how that goes. You know, the one thing I was looking uh, at today in scripture myself, and then I reminded myself that up here it says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And that comes from uh, Psalm 19. And there's a whole lot to that. Um, it says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, the Lord, uh, the, and day after day, they pour forth speech. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. So many of the things in God's creation, he speaks without words, and then people have no excuse. They have no excuse for saying, gee, I didn't... I didn't know the Lord. I didn't see, I didn't, I didn't perceive that. And so it's just that God's creation is to speak to him so boldly. Um, you know, it's been said many times, a, a, paint, a, a painting has a painter. Uh, a building has a builder. Well, a creation has a creator. And so taken from that is just this Omicron over here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, uh, I like We're going to go to Proverbs. And that's in chapter 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so, if the heavens declare God's glory, how in the world can you have wisdom without a relationship with God? What kind of wisdom is that? It's our own personal wisdom. So godly wisdom is something to seek, and we see it in his word. And so we're going to go to God's word today. Pastor's preaching from Mark, chapter 1, where we've been, we've been in Mark uh, the last few weeks. And uh, we'll take a look at that. As always, I say, I wonder where Pastor will go with this uh, bit of text. And so we'll, we'll look forward to that. So... Um, Welcome. It's good to have everybody here. Uh, last week I was in purple for different reasons. Um, <laughs> it was written in purple, and that didn't turn out what we wanted it to. But this week we're in purple. Pastor's got his shirt. Jerry's got his shirt. I'm going to invite you every first every first Sunday of the month. I invite you to wear purple. We'll have purple Sundays uh, every. Every purple, a purple every Sunday would be a, a bit much, but on the first Sunday of the month, why not? We can all wear our purple shirts together. So let's, uh, let's prepare our hearts for, for worship. Lord, we praise you, we thank you. The heavens do declare your glory. They declare that uh, we serve an awesome God who is the creator of all that is seen and unseen. And so, Lord, we just praise you that we're able to come to you and seek your word, seek your wisdom for our lives. And apart from you, there is no wisdom. So, Lord, we just look to you today as we come into this place with anticipation, Lord, that you will meet us here in this place, that you will fill our hearts and the sanctuary with your spirit. And Lord, we, uh, we pray that we can encounter the living God through the hearing of the word today. So we lift up this time and uh, pray that you will receive our worship as it is intended. And all this we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and we'll worship.
chapter 6, uh, Jesus talks to the disciples and tells them how to pray. And so we are going to pray here in just a minute. And after we do, after we pray, we'll dismiss the kids to go um, down the hall for um, Sunday morning live. So we'll, we'll do that in a minute. But we're going to pray. And, um, you know, I've talked about this so many times, about having people in your life who you love, who don't know Jesus, and what a heartache that is. the same place you are with Jesus. And the scripture is very clear about what that means. And so to have loved ones, friends, relatives who are lost. So I would just encourage you when we pray to do that. Um, we're having a, a get together with my family today and that's where my heart is. For those who will be there who know Jesus, I celebrate. For those who come and don't know Jesus, So we'll, uh, we'll go to prayer, and as always, we'll pray out loud, and you can, again, use that Acts prayer uh, method, which is uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So we just want to start out by telling God who he is. We just pray and tell God who he is in, to us. And uh, then we can go into that time of confession, knowing and when we confess to God, believe me, we're not telling God anything he doesn't already know. So we go to that confession time. And then we have that time um, thanking God for just all the things he's done in our lives and then bringing our prayers and desires of our hearts to the Lord. Spend a couple of minutes doing that. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll continue to move into some more worship time. So let's pray. I'm going to pray out loud, you're going to pray out loud, we're going to do all that simultaneously. Lord, I just praise you.
God is good. And all the time, you didn't say it like you mean it. God is good. And all the time, let's stand up and say it. Say it better than sitting down. God is good. All the time. All the time. Let us prepare our hearts for God's word this morning as we uh, look on the screen and say this word together. You can lift up a Bible. Uh, in an act of professing your faith in the Word of God. This is my Bible, the Word of God. It is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Lord, open my ears to receive it and prepare my heart to contain it. I submit my will to it as the final authority in my life. Speak now, Lord Jesus, while I listen. Thank you. Please be seated. I bring grace, mercy, and peace to you this morning from God, our Father, His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who calls us together in faith. Today ends the season of Epiphany as we have been seeing Jesus reveal Himself. It is after His birth, and He had grown up after some 30 years. And immediately he gets on the scene and begins to reveal himself to Israel as the Son of God. And through miraculous powers and signs and wonders, he is working it, he is working it, and people are seeing the distinction between him and any other prophet that had uh, lived. So the authority, power, and miracle that had not been seen in Israel since the times of the early prophets with what they were seeing at this time. Uh, a matter of fact, we could almost agree that the generation that uh, were present when Jesus emerged on the spotlight uh, had never seen, but only heard about miracles. They had not seen one. They heard about how the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea and they came in the wilderness and God provided manna for them and all those things that they went through, they heard the stories about it. So they were truly caught at heart to see him do these magnificent miracles that he was working before their very eyes. You have to understand that during the period of the prophet, it ended and then there was a 400 years silence period where God was saying nothing to Israel, doing nothing, preparing for this coming of the Messiah, his son. And he wanted so that when Jesus appeared, there would be a, a distinction between him and every other prophet I've ever seen. So there was this period of silence. And then John the Baptist came prepared away. And next we see in the picture is Jesus Christ. So last week, we looked at one of the reasons why Jesus had so much power and authority. It was what we talked about last week. During his earthly ministry, he had so much power and authority. And one might say it's because he is the son of God, and I disagree with that. Because Jesus is not just God, he was fully God and fully man. And because he was fully man, and God was going to use this man to bring life back to the world, so this man had to be tested and tried. And this man had to go into the wilderness and go through trials and temptations. And what made him successful in his ministry, what made him so powerful in his ministry, one of the things we looked at last week was his obedience to the word of God. His obedience to the word of God. And, uh, and, and also, we looked at the principle for deactivating demonic possessions and influences upon our lives. How to deactivate uh, demonic possessions and influences upon our lives. We looked at that last week as well. So Jesus obeyed the word. And that's why in the wilderness, when an evil one came to tempt him, we kept on hearing him say the words, it is written. It is written. No, it is written. So he did not deviate from the word of God, which is the source of the power. And the source of the power of every Christian is the word of God. And so he did not deviate from it. And so we looked at that. We look at how to deactivate demonic possession upon our lives. And just as Jesus submitted to the lordship and authority of the Father, so we are to submit to his lordship 
and the third. And in submitting to it is how we deactivate the works of demonic forces upon our lives. And there's a text in the Bible that gives us this truth. It's found in James chapter 4, verse 7. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil. And he will what? Flee from you. That's the text. That's the premise. The text that we can use to deactivate spiritual uh, uh, attacks on our lives. The first thing we have to do is what? Submit to the Lordship of Christ. Submit to God, the Bible says. That's what Jesus did. He submitted to his Father. And that's not open again when yet he keeps saying, my will is to do the will of the one who sent me. So he was under that authority. And so it made him successful in his journey on earth. I'm talking about his faith journey with God. And those of us, and I said it last week, I closed last week's message, that Christianity is a life. Christianity is a life. It is not a stem that we put on ourselves and walk around. Jesus says, you must be what? Born again. And he used that to tell us that just as we have life in the physical world, so he wants us to have life in the spirit. So when a person gets born into this world, what happens? Your next thing is to strive to survive through the courses of life. And that's when the baby drops out of the womb. The first thing he does or she does is cry. Like he's saying, what in the world is this? And then he starts, or he starts to fight for his or her life from that point on, making choices. And the parents help the child if he or she reaches a certain age, and then she or he starts fighting for herself, going to school, learning this, doing this, eating, feeding yourself, and trying to make it through this life. That's how it is with the spiritual life, my friends. It is not just be born and sit down. There are too many malnourished Christians living on the earth today. They are not being fed. They are not doing nothing. And that's why we don't feel God. We don't feel God. You don't feel like praying. You don't feel like going to Bible study. You don't feel like going to church. You don't feel nothing because your life in the spirit is so dry. You are not making the effort to strive and make it happen. And how do we strive? The first thing that is needed is to submit to the Lordship of Christ. That's where it begins. The, the life of the Spirit begins with submitting. He is the source of that life. And that's what he tells us in John 15. I'm the vine and you are the branches. Have you seen a branch do anything for itself? Have you seen a branch bear fruit without the vine? So submitting to the Lordship of Christ is where it begins. So submit, he says, and then in that submission, there is the ability to what? Resist the devil. And unless the Christian is submitted, you can't resist. So today I want us to reveal another very important element that initiates power and authority in the Lord's ministry that is important for us to pay attention to today because I believe if applied, we change the way we do ministry, we change the way we live our Christian life, if applied. I told you last week that uh, we have a lot of Christians who are informed but are not transformed. We learn God's word, and when the Bible text is quoted, we, 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 we end the verse. We know it, we know where to find it. We know all the stories in the Bible. We've heard all the messages. But we have just gotten only informed. No transformation is taking place. Why? Because we are not taking the word of God that David says, Your word have I hit in my heart that I might not sin against you. We don't get to that point in our Christian faith. So we just feel good when we hear a good message, or we feel good when we read God's word, and we walk away, and we get informed, and feel good about the information. And sometimes it becomes so boring that you heard it over and again. And the moment the message started, I, I heard about Jonah and the ark already. And you just sit over there and listen to the pastor finish up, and then you go home. But folks, it's deeper than that. Let me tell you, every word that comes from God's word, every time the word of God is dipped into, there are new substances coming. See, this text from Mark, I've been preaching for over 30 years, and I've preached this, this text over 30 times. But every time it came out, something new came out with it. And we need to open up our, our hearts to really draw 
what God has in store for us. So throughout the first chapter of Mark, we find Jesus going about his father's business with what? Focus. In other words, we find no distraction in him at all. He is focused. You see, this world has the tendency to make us shift focus. There are just too many things out there crying for attention that it would cause us to shift focus. Jesus kept his focus on the will of the Father, the one who calls him. But here's another thing about the Lord's ministry that I think we need to pay attention to. And that is his passion. His passion. It was his passion that drove his vision. You see, a vision that is never driven by passion is dead on arrival. If your vision is not driven by passion, it's going to die. And that's why you see in the cemetery today, we have so many books that were never written. We got songs that were never sent and sermons that were never preached. We got gifts that were never used that have been placed in the cemetery because people knew what God wanted them to do, but they didn't have the drive to do it. They did not let the passion or the flame of the spirit drive that passion to get to do what God wants them to do. Every Christian loved God. And every Christian loved to do the things of God. That's why uh, uh, the Bible says the spirit is what? Willing. But the, you yeah, preach with me. The flesh is what? The flesh is weak. And we follow or are driven by the weakness of the flesh. And we cannot find that drive to do God's will. The flesh is weak. The flesh does not desire anything that God desires. Let me tell you, I don't care how born again you are, that flesh is never going to get saved. The flesh is corrupt. All right? And it's going to be that way. So you have to know this as you become a Christian. All right? And that flesh will try to drive your life. Let me tell you, I don't want to be here this morning. I want to be home sleeping in the bed. But I'm here because I'm not driven by the desires of my flesh. I'm, I'm driven by the desire of my spirit. I have chosen to walk in the spirit and not gratify the desire of the flesh. That's where it begins for the Christian. So if you are a born again Christian and you're questioning, but why is it I don't have that drive? Because the spirit of God is quenched and is grieved in you. And so because of that, you cannot find a drive to do nothing. This flesh is not going to push you. It's not going to pull you. It's not going to drive you. It's not going to give you the passion that you need for God. The only place that passion comes from is from the Spirit of God. He would drive that. So Jesus, the Bible says, was led by the Spirit. That's what the Bible tells us. He was led by the Spirit. And because he was led by the Spirit, he was able to do a whole lot of things in his ministry that made him very distinct from every other prophet that lived on the earth. So his, his vision was his passion. And he drove it with passion. A lot of us have vision right now that are just sitting with us. It is not being used. And we find all of the excuses in the world for not using our vision. When you have a vision and you lack the knowledge to carry it out, it dies on arrival. Listen to this. It is very, very important that we understand passion is like the combustion that, that, that happens when an engine is turned on. All right? You turn that engine on, that turbo engine on, and the fire will, will, will ignite into that engine, and then it will cause that pressure, and then we call that horsepower. And when you step on that gas, when the car moves, you'll be like, wow. Especially for the men. That's why we like to hear. Okay? Yeah. And so, so that's that drive that God wants us to have for him, to be able to move things in the spiritual realm. He wants us to have the drive. But the flesh is not allowing us. Jesus took off his ministry with passion, looking straight ahead of him. That's what he did. Not looking to the left, not looking to the right. There were a lot of things to call his attention and distract him from doing the will of the Father, but he kept his focus. Look at this, this, this passage in Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, for the joy set, not on the side of him, not behind him, not over him, but the joy set before him. You see that? He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus kept his focus, my friend. I'm asking you this morning to keep your focus in God. You have to keep your focus in God. If we don't do 
when this world is going to just drive us apart. You see, when Jesus went to cross the river, the sea with his disciples, there was a storm that came against them. You know what that storm was for? It was to stop them from getting over on the other side. And the devil would bring storms in our lives to stop us from getting over on the other side. You have to understand it. And if you don't have that drive to push forward, you're going to be stopped from making miles in the spirit. That's where the protection of life is. So now, let me tell you the three things that Jesus was very passionate about that moved his vision straight to the finish line and speak to you this morning on the theme, three essentials that moved Jesus' vision. So look at those three things. First is his passion for prayer. Okay? His passion for prayer. Look at Mark 1, 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he what? Prayed. Notice how the days prior to moving, I mean the morning rather, the days prior to morning had been very brutally busy for Jesus. Notice that. He was in the temple preaching and then healing people. He moves from there immediately. He gets to Simon uh, Peter's house. And his mother is sick, takes her out of the bed, she's well, she ministers to them, uh, preparing meals and other things. And the moment the crowd knew he was there, everybody brought their sick at the house. The house is crowded, he's healing people, it is midnight, he is still ministering to people. And then he gets up from there at that time, and he goes to bed, and he gets up early in the morning, the script is telling us, you try me rationally. From a rational perspective, you tell me, do you think Jesus really wanted to wake up? Huh? You think about it. When he wake up, his physical body was tired from doing all of that. He did not want to wake up. You know what it's like when you have to work all day and you bed at night. And then you went to bed like one o'clock in the morning, have to get up three in the morning. That's what Jesus did when he talked about him getting up early in the morning. Usually, uh, during that time, upon the, the history, the, the, the setting, what happened was people got up by 5 o'clock in the morning to start the day. The Bible says very early. What it's telling you is he got up before everybody else was up. Okay? He got up very early in the morning before everybody. So he was up three, at 3 o'clock praying. This amazes you, but you see, he spent time with God in prayer. Prayer is so essential for our spiritual journey, you would not, you would not be able to see success without prayer. A church that does not pray is a church that is on her way to die. A Christian that does not pray is a Christian that's on his or her way to defeat. We need prayer in our life. And I tell you, prayer does not inform God. I told you that the other time. Prayer does not entice God. Prayer doesn't transform God. You know what prayer does? It's only, it only invites God into your life. That's all it does. So when we pray, we invite God in to our lives. And that's what God wants us to do, to invite him in. He's not going to come and intrude your life without your permission. Why? Because we have free will to choose what we want. That's why how God made us. And in order for him to come, he says what? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not going to knock that door down and walk over and come in your house. You have to invite him in. And that's one of the reasons why prayer is so essential. Very early in the morning, Jesus was up. Three, four in the morning, he went. What did Jesus pray about? I believe he thanked the Father for the day before, for all of the blessings, for him being with him and, and allowing him to work the miracles and minister to the people and do the will that he had sent him to do. The second reason he had to ask for strength for the day ahead. And so he gets up early in the morning and is in the presence of the Father fellowshipping that morning. Why did Jesus even have to, have to pray? Even though he was God. But you have to understand, I said it already, that he was man also. And he knew that men ought always to pray and not faint. We get stressed. And we get, we get weary over the trials of life. My brother just passed away, uh, did me yesterday night. My older brother, 
And many people call me and ask me, are you going to go to church? Are you going to preach? I'm like, what? This is not going to stop me. The scripture says, what shall separate me from the love that's in Christ Jesus? Yes, I'm going to preach. I had the, the accident and people asked, are you going to church? Yes, I'm going to church. If I put my two feet on the ground, I'm going. And I'm going to do the will of God. I'm going to keep my focus. And that's what God is calling us to do. Jesus gets up in the morning. He's not thinking about the situations that he had to deal with, but he takes it to God in prayer. Man ought always to pray and not faint. As man, he was vulnerable to temptation. So he had to pray for the strength to overcome that. He needed that source of strength from the Lord that Isaiah 40 talked about. That those who wait on the Lord will what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Have you seen an eagle? The eagle will fly above the storm. They are strong enough to go above the storm. They love to see storm because the storm makes them to fly higher. And that's what God is saying. That when we Christians pray and ask for strength, and we have the, the strength of the Spirit of God with us, when these problems come, we will learn to rise above it. And that's what he wants us. He didn't tell us that we would not have problems. Jesus told us, he says, in this world, you will have problems. He didn't hide that. But what did he tell us again? He says, but well, I have overcome the world. And that overcoming doesn't mean that he took the problems out. But it means that he is in us. And greater is he that is in you than the problems that are in the world. And sometimes we forget that the greater one lives in us when the problem shows up because the problem can really stare at us. The problem can get bigger than us to the point where we don't see God. We just see the problem. But we have to remind ourselves that the greater one lives inside of us and he's there to help us through the storm. So why did Jesus see a, 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 seek a solitary place to pray? Why did he go to a quiet place to pray? He needed no distraction. He needed no distractions. Some of us, we only pray when we are in the group with corporate, where everybody's praying, lifting up their hands. That's the thing we get fired up. And we're shouting and screaming, especially in the charismatic church. You gotta, you gotta pray higher than the next person and then loud and all that stuff. Jesus says, no. He says, when you wanna pray, go in the closet and lock yourself up and pray. He said, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you well. Openly. That's why Jesus has so much success in his ministry. Because when the king turned to pray, he found a solitary place. And he went in that quiet place and spent his time in there praying to the Lord. And so when it came time for him to go out, he comes out of that place, he gets out, and he, he touches people and they're getting healed. And he doing these great and wonderful things that people have not seen before. Because while he spent time with the Father. So Jesus was very intentional about getting his father's will done. His father was not one. He, he did not come to the father in prayer and said, let my will be done, father. He says, let your will be done. How often do we go to God in prayer and seek for God's will to be done in our lives? How often do we do that? Many times we go with, uh, with, with a list of things. All right? And we bring this list and we name everything on it. <clears throat> and we walk and we believe that we're going to get it. But we don't consider the fact that the God for whom we have prayed is the one who created us. And God, when he created us, let me tell you, there is not a single person walking on the streets of this planet that God did not design with purpose. Everybody has a plan, and the plan is in God's hands. The plan for our lives is in his hands. He didn't leave anybody out. Everybody has a plan with God. That's what he told Jeremiah. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And he was not talking about knowing by name. He was telling you that your life has been laid out. And I have it all laid out for you. And that's why everybody uh, in the world, God has a plan for. But we don't trust God. That's the problem. We don't trust through our life. So we come and we bring what we want to him to bless it. Bless it now. I need to go. Bless it. And God said, no, this is not for you. When we pray, let your will be done, Lord. That means we trust God. That's what it means. It means we trust God. 
We, it means that we know what we say when we say God is good. I was going to wait for you to say that. And all the time. Okay. Then it means that when we come to that point where we can give our things to God and trust him with it, then we understand what it means when we say God is good all the time. God is good. And that's why when he created the world, the Bible says, on the first day when he got done doing his thing, he looked back and he says what? It was good. He goes back the second time he creates, come back and looked at it. was good. Because God is good. And anything that comes from God is good. Anything that comes from his hands to us is good. And if we have our lives laid, laid out, why don't we trust our lives with God? Why? And this is what Jesus is doing. Trusting the Father with his life, going to him praying with his life and telling him, let your will be done for you. Remember when he went in the garden of Gethsemane? And he prayed, Father, Please, let this cup pass. Because he saw what he was about to face on the cross. Please let the cup pass. But then he gets up and says, nevertheless, not my will, let yours be done. And so we, when we pray in the Lord's prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I hope you understand what we say. But when you pray that prayer, you need to really trust God. That his will is good for us. We need to trust him with all of what he has for us. So we just talked about Jesus' passion for prayer. Let's look at his passion for proclamation. Okay? Look in Mark 1, 36 to 38. Simon and his, his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Oh, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Now, here, the scripture tells us that they went looking for him and they found him. Where did they find, find, uh, 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 found him? Where did they find him? They found him praying. Jesus was still praying when they went. Now, day had broken. People had gotten up and he was still in prayer and they went and found him in prayer. That tells you and I that Jesus prayed for hours. He didn't pray for 20 minutes. All right? He prayed for hours. In the presence of God. He did not allow his schedule for the day to interrupt the time that he had to spend with God in prayer. He stayed in there and went in there and prayed there for power, for hours. To the point that they came and found him. They looked at him, he was hiding. They found him and they interrupted his prayer time with this excitement about the fact that the people uh, were looking for Jesus. Everyone is looking for you. What, what were they trying to say? They were so excited that Jesus was, was gaining population and gaining people, you know, and, and, and so they, they, they're telling him, it's your time, it's your time to shine. People are looking for you. You know, go, go, go there and claim your Messiah ship. That's what they're saying now. Go and take over, man. Create your army, start your government. The people are here waiting on you. You know, and, 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 and that's exactly what we do today, especially us pastors. We are looking for fame. We're looking for name. We are looking to be on the spotlight. And we want higher positions in the church. And we want higher titles in the church. And now they're going to make up all these different titles. They got the bishop and the, 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 the apostles and the apostle bishop and the bishop bishop. And you know, they keep making more and more and more and more and putting it on themselves. Crowning themselves with glory. That's what we do. And we miss the mark. We miss the true reason why Christ came into the world and why he called us into ministry. You know? I got a call once and they were calling me to go back home because they want to crown me bishop. I said, bishop? I said, yes. I said, I'm already a bishop. I'm satisfied with being a pastor. And what is a pastor? Pastor is a bishop. They don't understand they're making these titles. Okay? We have to be very cautious. Like Jesus was, he did not shift his focus. He kept his focus on what God had called him to do and didn't allow anything to stand in the way of that. All right? And that's what he's calling all of us to do. Jesus says, no, I am not losing my focus. Let's go somewhere else. There are others who have not heard yet. Let's go there. Notice that the word preach comes from the word proclaim, and proclaim means to herald. Is to speak out. This is not something that is only meant for the pastor. It's not just the job of the pastor. It's like 
an evangelist going out and proclaiming to the world that Jesus is Lord. And that's something that all of us are called to do. All right? All of us are called to be evangelists. All of us are called to go out on the streets and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. So this is not, this is just an example of Christ is showing about how the church needs to not be a monument, but the church needs to be a movement. The church needs to move, all right? Not to sit one place and become a, 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 a group of, a society group or something, I don't know, but God wants us to go out the door and make impact in the community. And this is why we, as Holy Nativity, is doing this, this evangelistic drive that is going to start right after Easter, where we're going to meet and, you know, have a workshop on evangelism and see how we can make impacts in our community, in our world here. It is so important. God wants us out. He's not trying to build no monument. He's trying to build a movement. So we talk about the, his passion for prayer, his passion for proclamation. Lastly, let's talk about his passion for people. Look at Mark 139. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogue and driving out demons. So notice that Jesus' ministry was not gain fame. He was not looking for fame, but rather he was looking to gain people. He was not looking to gain fame. He was looking to gain people. That was what his ministry was. He was sent in the world to seek for people. And that's what every single person who is born into the world has come here to do. Do you know your life is not intended for you? We have to become selfless because our lives are not intended for us. I don't care where you work. I don't care what kind of career you have taken up. You have to understand that it was not for you. It was to, to serve others. Whatever it is that you're doing is to serve others. And that's what our lives is about. And that's what we have been placed here for people. Jesus showed that when he came on the earth. And he made great impact by the way he traveled and touched lives. So to prevent people from perishing, the Bible says that's why Jesus came. So whosoever believes in him will never perish. You have to understand, my friends, hell is a real place. It's a real place where people die and spend eternity. And they burn in the lake of fire forever and ever. The fire is never going to go out. All right? And that's why God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to die and go to that place. Because that place was not designed for us. It was designed for the devil and his angels, fallen angels. Not for us. But the devil says, I'm not going there alone. He said, you love men so much, I'm going to deceive them and make them follow me there. And God says, that's not going to happen on my watch. So he came and clothed himself in human flesh and came down here with the one objective of bringing us back unto him. And when Jesus got on that cross, just before he took his last, last breath and said, it is finished, he was, he was saying to us that the devil just got whooped. Okay? And so he took charge. And now everyone who looks at the cross can obtain eternal life. Everyone. Because Jesus came for people. That was the reason for his mission. He did not come here to create fame for himself. But he came here for people to prevent us from perishing. He, his passion for people took him through the following. Jesus accepted humility. All right? He humbled himself, the Bible says in Philippians 2 8. He humbled himself. Jesus was in heaven, seated with the Father, and he brought himself down lower than the angels that worshiped him. Lower than the angels, he came down and became man. Just to identify with you and me. Laying down his glory, the Bible says, he left his glory in heaven and came down here with no repetition, nothing. Okay? He came down to the earth, took on the human body. Philippians 2 8. He became poor. The Bible says, he says in, in Matthew 8, verse 20, that the foxes have holes and the bird have net, nests. He says, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus did not build a house. His whole ministry was about people. He went around impacting lives. He suffered rejection in John 1 11. 
He came, the darkness was his own, but his own did not receive it. He despised it. He suffered rejection. He suffered pain. He was beaten. He was spit on. His beard was pulled. They crowned him with, with, with thorns. And they crucified him on the cross. All of that was because of you and because of me that he went through that just to snatch us out of the pit of hell. Jesus went through all of this. Then he died. And that death on that cross was so that you and I would never die and separ get separated from God for all eternity. That's why Jesus did this. Now Jesus is sitting in heaven up high and he's looking down low. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so I have sent you. But what does he see when he looks down low? Does he see selfishness or selflessness? I bet he sees a lot of uh, selfishness. Instead of us making ourselves selfless for the sake of the cross, we become selfish. Instead of us making ourselves poor so that we will be rich, when Jesus looks down and sees in poverty, he sees prosperity. We are seeking for prosperity. When he looks down, instead of him seeing rejection, he's seeing inclusion. We are including everybody. Why can't we just come and get along? And God is saying, no. Be separated. Come from as long as them and be separated. They will reject you, but be separated. And because we don't want to be separated, we are looking for inclusion. But we are called to accept rejection. Instead of pain, he looks down and he sees gain. People want to gain. That's all we want. We don't want the pain. And he looks down. Instead of seeing a cross, he's seeing crown. People want to be crowned. And the Spirit of God is grieved. And the Spirit of God is quenched. And the church of God is left powerless. Because we are not submitting to the Lordship of the one who sent us. And because we do not trust in the almighty power of the one who sent us out to people, we are dying. I pray that the enabling, uniting power and spirit of the, of the Lord will come and take residence in our heart and stir up that passion that we need so that our vision will be birthed. So that new things will happen in the spiritual realm, that the evil one will see God at a new level in our heart, working in and through us that which he calls us to do. That the self in us will die, and that Christ in us will rise. And then we can see it as Paul says it, Philippians Galatians 3.20, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And we kill that self, self, selfishness inside of us, and become selfless for the sake of the cross. And the day's message is intended to rebuke us and for us to encourage us so that we will rise up and be transformed from where we are at because there are heights in God that we can reach that we have not reached because God is so high we can't get over him and he is so cool we can't get under him he is so wide we can't get around him no one can reach the maximum place in God because God is so big there is just so much to get from him don't relent don't get tired don't get weary. Don't stop. Keep pushing. Keep advancing your, 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 your life in Christ. Because there's just so much in there for us to have. Don't get too complacent to where you are at and think you have arrived. God has a life for us. And I pray that this word from God this morning would encourage our hearts and keep us steadfast in our faith. Knowing always, he follows me and never bring you this far and leave you. God will never teach you to swim and let you drown. He would not build his home in you and move away or lift you up and let you down. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. With those words, uh, I hope all, all of you have received the communion, and I'm going to, we can come and stand in the line now. If you have received the communion, just come in line. If you haven't, we'll just walk around with it. No, we're coming here in an hour here. Just come and prepare and open up the, the, the whipper first. Yes. And uh, we're going to do it one at a time. Come in line. Come on. Bless the 
of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We can be the body of Christ here for you. Now may the eating and drinking of the Lord's body and blood preserve and strengthen you and keep you steadfast in your faith to life everlasting. Amen. All right. Um, do we have any birthdays? I know of one. Angel is celebrating her birthday in two days from now. One day? Oh, it's tomorrow. Right. Sorry. Okay, so she's celebrating her birthday tomorrow. Grace. When is Grace's birthday? The sixth. The sixth? Oh. Fifth, sixth. All right, we're going to sing for the two of you. Let's stand up and sing happy birthday to them two. invite people to church, we came up with these cards. And the cards are information desk. We are encouraging people to bring people. Just to invite one or two people with you when you come into church. And it's just going to change things. You'd be surprised at the number of people that are out there today who uh, have the desire to come back to church. Some of them just left church. And they don't know how. They just need somebody to hold them by the hand and bring them. So if we can make it an effort to talk to people and they may ask you something about your church, just give them this card. We have an information desk. I have some here. So don't, don't just walk away after I say this and don't take some of these cards with you. Uh, you come, come across people there who uh, might, you might just bless by inviting them to church. So please, 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 let's take advantage of these cards. Um, with that, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Two songs. 